Hello and welcome to this episode three of series two of our podcast. Today we'll be talking about blood pressure, specifically non-invasive blood pressure. I want to just discuss um, why we use non-invasive blood pressure, how we do it, and what we can do with the results that we get. I'm joined, of course, today by Courtney. I'm um, going to share our experiences in practice and over the, uh, the years that we've been using this technology to bring to you, hopefully, some uh, tips and tricks that uh, you, you can take away with you. Good afternoon, Courtney. Hi, Keith. Um, I'm quite, I think I have to start by saying I'm quite excited about this episode because it's something we do every single day in practice, especially in our patients under anaesthesia. And with non invasive being the most common method in practice, I'm looking forward to kind of discussing the machines, discussing different techniques, um, like you said, what we're going to do with those numbers, and then um, just share our tips and tricks along the way. Because I do think sometimes we perhaps take some readings and potentially freak out a little bit at what the result is and not entirely, you know, not entirely be sure on what we should be doing with those numbers. So I'm quite looking forward to having a chat about it. Yeah, I think to some extent, non-invasive blood pressure has got a little bit of a bad press because it's, you know, um, sometimes tarnished with the fact that you don't always get reliable results. You know, you say people say, oh, oscillometric systems don't work and they're not very good and, um, you know, that they're unreliable. Well, I think to some extent, there's an element of truth in that, but I think a lot of the problems are associated with how you use the equipment, and it's all down to technique. It's getting that cuff. Well, first of all, getting the right cuff, getting the right size cuff, getting in the right place, you know, um, adequately ensuring that you've got the conditions to get a good signal, getting a signal, getting a reading. There's a lot along that pathway, which I think we need to talk about. Because um, if you don't follow all those steps, undoubtedly you will with an oscillometric system or even a Doppler system not get the results you expect to get. So it does have a bit of a bad press, but I think um, it's not a bad modality, um, non-invasive blood pressure, but it, you know, understanding how it works probably give you a better idea about how reliable and how accurate it's going to be. Um, so let's just sort of dive in and, and think about those things. So <clears throat> why? I think why NIBP? Basically, because it's easy to do, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. you haven't got to be skilled. You haven't got to find that that facial artery or that metatarsal artery and try and put an invasive line in. You can just put a cuff on a limb, cuff on a tail, make some adjustments to the machine, and away you go. So I think it's easy, it's non-invasive, and that lends itself to, you know, ease and quick use in practice. Um, and I guess, Courtney, you've had some experience with this in practice. Yeah, I mainly my experience is based around using oscillometric and Doppler devices in anaesthetized patients. Um, and there are some small differences, both in techniques and perhaps the readings that we get in our patients that are conscious can, compared to when they're anaesthetized. But uh, like you said, I think some of these devices do get a bit of a bad rap, um, kind of for being random number generators. But I think if you can try and make sure your setup and, and everything is as good as you can get it, perhaps we can gain some information at least based on the trends of those. So I will monitor the blood pressure of every anaesthetized patient that I have in front of me. Um, so not so much the conscious perhaps examinations that you might have come in for, you know, your hyperthyroid cat that you're doing a quick blood pressure check on, but definitely pre-anesthesia, peri-anesthesia, and also in the recovery period as well, I always utilise my blood pressure machine. Okay, so maybe we can just think about, um, before we get into the specifics of anesthesia monitoring, what we could be doing in terms of non-invasive. So we've basically got, basically got three systems. We've got the oscillometric, which everybody's familiar with, the cuff around the uh, the tail or a paw and the machine that does the does the working for you. You've got the Doppler system where you again you use a cuff, but you need a, an associated Doppler and um, a sphygmomanometer to you know pump the cuff up and look at the pressure. And then you've got um, what is typically used in in human medicine, which is a, a sphygmomanometer, uh, a cuff, and listening with a stethoscope. Well, I think you know, we're all agreed that's not really open to us. Too much hair two small <laughs> arteries, not, we're not going to hear those sounds very well. So we're down to two basic systems, aren't we? The, the oscillometric, which may be subdivided into the standard oscillometric and the high definition, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. And then we've got the Doppler system. So the Doppler, um, you know, 
Doppler is an acoustic system, it's going to send out that ultrasonic wave, pick up an uh, artery uh, pulse wave and get a reflected sound and you're going to hear whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. You know, um, so what you basically do, just, just for the listeners that are not familiar with Doppler, you place a cuff around um, uh, a limb, an upper part of a limb, put your Doppler on a lower part of the limb to pick up maybe a radial artery or metatarsal artery, hold it in place, normally tape it in place, a bit of ultrasound gel so that it's getting a continuous sound. And then you, you inflate the cuff proximal to that until the sound stops. And then you look at the value on your uh, manometer and you slowly reduce or sorry, allow the gas to, to come out, reducing the pressure until you start to hear sounds. And at the point where you start to hear sounds, obviously, then you're starting to get some arterial flow. And if you've got some arterial flow, that must mean we've now uh, the pressure is below systolic. So we say that's at the point where, where we've got systolic pressure. As you carry on, that intensity increases and you go to a peak intensity and then it does tend to um, reduce off a little bit after that, but you always get a sound, even when the, the, the guff is fully released, you've got that continuous sound. So we've got an instrument there that's going to nicely identify our systolic pressure. And then the other pressure we're possibly going to get an indication of is mean arterial. But I think we can all say that we can basically forget the diastolic. It's not going to be any, mm. any good indicating diastolic. So we've got a good indication of systolic, and possibly the point of maximum intensity, you know, the loudest point of that that um, that Doppler noise, you could say that oh, tends to be associated with mean arterial pressure. But I think we've been a bit vague here, and the, and the science is a bit vague. Um, and one person's assessment of maximum intensity is not necessarily the same as another person's uh, assessment. So I would tend to think that Doppler is a nice system, easy to use. It's very good for the feedback side of it because you know you can hear it, you can know you've got a signal, um, so you can use it very easily to get a get a value. But you're only really going to get a systolic value. Um, is that you know from your point of view in practice what you've been using it for and how you've been using it? Definitely, I um, I enjoy using a Doppler because you do have that constant, like you said, in the background even between readings. And I've always used the Doppler to kind of give me an indication of systolic in dogs and then uh, to kind of guide me on a trend in cats, because for cats, it's kind of somewhere between the mean and systolic. But in terms of listening to those sounds, um, obviously, when that first little comes through, that's what we take as systolic. And I do think some of the people that can hear perhaps the changeover to mean where it goes like and it gets louder, I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> How did you do that? Like I've been listening to Dopplers for years and I still can't pick up on that. And perhaps it's because I need to put a stethoscope onto the bell of the Doppler, you know, my stethoscope bell onto the Doppler speaker. Maybe I need to use headphones. Maybe the theatre needs to be the optimal environment where there's no noise interference. But I I think I could definitely identify the initial little psh, psh, and then suddenly be like, oh, yeah, there's a louder sound now, but I wouldn't be able to find that crossover. So I've typically just been using Doppler um, in anesthesia on dogs to kind of estimate what the systolic might be. And then in cats, knowing it's probably just a little bit below systolic, um, but still just using those numbers as my trends. Yeah, and I think it is, it's great to use it for trends, isn't it? And I think no one would say that you know, on a Doppler system that you make a measurement and it's 123 millimeters mm -hmm. of mercury and the next time you do it, it's 121 so the blood pressure's gone down i think we would just say you know that's that's normal variability um if it goes down to 100 then things are definitely changing so it, yeah. it, it's a trend and it's a an assessment of the magnitude of the change over time as well but it is a little bit hands-on isn't it you have to make that manual measurement every time you can't just put it away and put it on and leave it so the the, the nice thing about oscillometric systems is they are automated you know they all tend to be automated you put a cuff on, you set the machine to go, and it will do a reading. And then often they can be programmed to two minutes later, three minutes, whatever, repeat and do another read. So you get serial measurements going on uh, during your anesthesia. <clears throat> so I think we need to think a little bit about non-invasive blood pressure and the oscillometric technique. And as I said before, possibly gets a bit of bad press, but you will get reasonable and reliable readings if you, A, choose the correct cuff. B, put it in the right place. C, put it in the correct orientation in the right place. Mm -hmm. and, and D, be aware of where you're placing it related to the heart as well. So I think maybe 
from your experience, we could just discuss some of those things, you know, the placement, the cuff size. I think cuff size is um, something that I know you're from now familiar with and, and are using. Maybe you can explain to the listeners about cuff size selection. Sure. I do think it's perhaps something that does confuse a lot of people, like what size should I use? How should I measure it? Where should I put it? And just talking about the reliability of the results, like you just said, it all depends on if we've made the setup all correctly. So if we choose a cuff size that's too big, it's going to give us a um, a blood pressure reading that is kind of artificially or falsely low. And then if we choose a cuff size too small and too tight, it's going to give us a really high blood pressure, an artificially high blood pressure. So I don't really think we can underestimate the importance of these cuffs and how they're designed, how we should use them, the information that's on them, where we should place them on the limbs, what direction it should be in. Um, I don't think we value enough how carefully these things have been designed. So definitely when I'm choosing a cuff, I, I think I choose mine differently to how you would choose yours, Keith, because I know you have a mathematical brain. I know you like um, thinking of like radiuses and circumferences whereas for me I sometimes you know I get a little bit caught up and a bit lost in maths and thinking about radiuses and diameters so personally for me I pick up a blood pressure cuff and I everyone should do this next time you go back into your practice pick up your blood pressure cuff and just have a look at the information that's on your cuff because on the inside of the cuff, so the part that goes and gets wrapped around the patient's limb or their tail or wherever you're going to measure the blood pressure, there's actually a range on there. Um, and this is what I use to estimate the cuff size. So actually, I don't do any maths, which I know, Keith, you probably do do a bit more maths than me. But I just pick up this cuff. I have a look at uh, cause a neonatal human cuff. So they've got nice pictures of bears and everything on them. So I pick up my cuff. I have a look for the reference range. And if you have a look on the other side of the cuff that has a reference range, you'll also see two other things. One of them is a reference line. And then one of them is an arrow that says artery, which actually is quite important. So just starting with the reference line. If you wrap that cuff around the limb, that reference line that's on the outer part of the cuff should actually line up within the reference range on the inside of the cuff. And that's how you can kind of estimate that your cuff size is going to be appropriate. And I wouldn't be putting my cuff on super tight as well. I'm not trying to make a tourniquet out of it. And I'm also not making like a loose bracelet to hang from the patient's paw. So I'm, I'm kind of making it what I would say uh, snug, which of course is going to be very subjective to me. So I pick up my cuff, I fold it over the limb, I make sure that the reference line is within the reference range, and then actually I make sure that the line that says artery is laying where the artery actually would be. So for example, if I was doing the, um, the forelimb, I wouldn't have the artery line or the artery indicator on my cuff on, you know, facing the lateral side of the patient. I would always try and twist the artery reference line to go underneath the pore, just where that artery is running. Um, and I'm sure Keith, you'll definitely love to tell us about the importance of that. Um, but I will select my cuff, line it all up appropriately, and then kind of set it to go. And depending on where I'm going to put it, I'm a big fan of the tail because it's really nice and cylindrical. The one thing I don't like anaesthetizing and putting blood pressure cuffs on are French Bulldogs because they have these triangular limbs and every time you put a cuff on it slips off or it doesn't wrap around nice and cylindrical it's it's kind of a bit wonky and it's tight at the top and loose at the bottom so they don't even have a tail you can put it on and um, so in those instances I quite like putting it below the hock uh, so where you put the cuff actually matters as well um, Obviously, when we go to the doctors as humans, we sit upright in a chair and we have the cuff placed on our arm at the level of the heart. And that's kind of OK in our anaesthetized patients as well that are perhaps laying in a lateral position. But if we take a step back and think about a perhaps a bitch spay who's on her back and she has her paws up in the air, or they're just elevated slightly from the heart, we need to think about gravity, really, and like the, the loss of momentum of that blood getting up to that pore where you've got the cuff. And conversely, if we think about it, if we're doing a procedure, perhaps a tail amputation and the dog's legs are hanging off the table, um, or we're doing like an anal sac surgery and the dog's legs are hanging off the table, maybe it's just a huge Great Dane and they are all just hanging off. If you put that cuff onto that limb or onto that tail and it is now below the level of the heart, then we've got gravity assisting 
uh, kind of like the, the pressure gradient there. So I think we need to realize that we have to interpret those results knowing that the height of the cuff can influence the number that we get, but also we can apply a correction factor to it as well. So it's nice and easy for every 10 centimeters above the heart that your cuff is. So for example, a dog laying on their back, for every 10 centimeters the cuff is placed above the heart, then we need to change that um, or we need to add about seven millimeters of mercury to that reading that we obtain. And same for if the patient has their paws hanging off the table and we've got gravity assisting, then we need to take away seven millimeters of mercury for every 10 centimeters that the cuff is below the heart. And I think this is really important when we're doing conscious blood pressure readings in our patients because we might get those um, I don't know, like nice greyhound coming for a blood pressure or German Shepherd coming for a blood pressure reading in consult and they're standing up and they've got this assistant of gravity getting the blood flow down. So that reading is actually going to be a bit higher than than it would be really. So if the patient's laying on the lateral side, it's not so much of a problem. But if they are, you know, legs in the air or they've got their legs off the table or you're doing a conscious blood pressure in the cage or in recovery or in consult, we must be mindful that that reading could actually be a bit different. So I like thinking whenever we take a blood pressure for our conscious patients in the wards, you know, when it's charted, do a blood pressure every four hours. Fantastic. I think also make note of where that cuff is when you took your reading and the position of that patient. So, for example, you might always say right for size two left lateral recumbency. And that's going to help you have a bit of consistency when you do your readings. You know, if the five o'clock nurse comes in, does a reading and they go, oh my gosh, it has gone up by like, I don't know, 30, 40, 40 millimetres of mercury. <gasps> Something's happening or it's gone down 30 or 40, 40 millimetres of mercury. Perhaps <laughs> the day staff were doing the blood pressure after the patient or has, you know, has stood up just before they go out for a, um, for a toilet break. Or maybe the patient was laying down when they were doing it, but now you've done it when they're standing up and that can also just factor the the result. So I think on the hospital chart for your conscious patients, definitely make note of where you took the blood pressure from, what size cuff you used, and the position that the patient was laying in. And you can also do this on your anaesthetic sheet. Brilliant. I think that's all really good information, actually. Particularly, I think about the um, the consistency. Of different people taking different blood pressure readings at different times. If they're not using the same cuff, the same limb, and the same position, they are going to get different values. Yeah, it's like bingo. Yeah, <laughs> Could, be <absolutely>. <laughs> Could be anything. Could be anything. That's really important. Yes. Um, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about cuffs. Um, you, you sort of suggested that um, uh, you use the lines on the cuff, and that's absolutely fine. But um, you know what um, us vets are like. Uh, we <laughs> use them time and time again. And sometimes you come to these cuffs, and the lines have worn away. So yeah, throw them yeah, away. <laughs> and, and yes, absolutely. The, probably the cuffs, not away. the bits. <laughs> yeah. The <laughs> But some of them, uh, I, I have used cuffs that really don't have those those guidelines. They have the the arrow for the um, artery, but don't have the guidelines. Um, and then you've got that 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 off sighted um, formula. Uh, it should be forty percent of the the, the lip circumference, which I find a little bit difficult to to do. And I just tend to use just a mathematical conversion of that is the same as, you know, it's twenty five. If you put the cuff width against the limb, it's 25% wider than the, the limb. I find that easier mentally to do than trying to work out what the circumference is. Um, but either way, you need to choose the appropriate cuff and, and probably would come to this anyway, but just want to make, make it clear to people, a lot of the machines, you have to set the setting in the machine to the cuff size. So, um, you know, I know that some, if you're using a, a cuff size one to two, then you have to have a, a low setting on, on your machine. If you put it up to a size five cuff, you have to tell the machine you put a size five cuff on because they just don't know. There's no way for the machine to work out what size cuff is on there. So that that's very good because otherwise you, you're often applying a an algorithm to a small cuff when you've actually got a big cuff on there. So that, that's an important point. And then the actual cuff itself looks like a fairly cheap disposable <laughs> bit of kit, but actually it's quite, um, an important little sensor and it has some important physics and physical characteristics where those tubes or those double tubes hoses come in that's the point where we're making our measurement that's the point of maximum signal strength if we're going to get a signal and you you mentioned putting it on the tail i like putting it on the tail i find that that little dip under the uh in the coccygeal um where the artery is is very convenient right at the base of the tail easy to put the uh the arrow marker there and put the cuff around 
Um, but it is very important that those two line up because we want to get that signal at the point where it's um, just where it's emerging from that tube. But I'm basically just to explain how this thing works. The whole cuff is the sensor. So it's not just where the, the artery sits above the um, that little tube. The whole cuff is a sensor. And the what's basically happening is as the blood pulses through the, the limb, the tail, whatever tissue we're in, that that blood fills out the, the muscle and expands it and thereby transposes that pressure wave into the cuff. So the whole cuff is the sensor. The reason I'm saying this is if you've got anything where that, that is touching that cuff or that cuff is leaning against or pressing against the, you know, the side of um, um, a cradle or the edge of the table or something and there's movement there, that cuff will pick up pressure waves from whatever it's touching. So you've got to be very careful with the dorsal and check that um, you don't induce other signals as well. That's why it's very difficult to do in moving conscious animals, because all it does is induce the signals you know, on top of what you're trying to measure makes it very difficult. Um, and yeah, just to sort of give you an anecdote for, um, you know, this, how the thing works. Um, if you, I don't know if you've done this, Courtney, I, I, I do this in airport lounges and you're sat there <laughs> waiting for a plane and you notice that the person opposite you has got their legs crossed and they've got their legs crossed at the knees. So they've got one knee directly over the other and they're sat there. And if you watch very carefully, um, you'll see that their foot will bounce periodically and their foot will bounce at the same rate as their heart rate because every time blood flows into their calf muscles and their, and their thigh muscles, it expands them and it just elevates like a little fulcrum. It just... Um, pivots about the knee and you just get this little bounce. So you can sit there and you can take people's heart rates just by looking at them when they're sat in the in the um, the airway uh, airport lounge. So I, I, I like, you know, I like to do that. I like to look at the person across me and see that their heart rate's you know, at 72. I think, well, that's okay. That person's fine. They're not going to cause any problems on the plane. They're not going <laughs> to collapse or whatever, you know. And uh, if you're feeling mischievous, you just give them a wink and see whether the heart rate goes up at all, you know. Um, <laughs> Just to quantify your um just to your quantify ob the, the physics and the science. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um but I digress a bit, but I just point out that, that yeah, that's the whole process. That 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 swelling of the of the musculature and everything, that's what causes the, the signal to go into the that little uh uh cuff that we put around and then that signal gets passed back. So one very important point is that if you put it on the say we put this on the tail of a German shepherd shepherd dog, well, you can imagine that. Yeah, probably a hairless area, area region right under the base of the tail where you put in the cuff. But around the rest of it, you've got this really thick, coarse, almost wiry type hair. That's going to be a perfect cushion for um, for for the sound waves, the pressure waves in the in the cuff itself. And they're going to tend to dampen it out. So that, that artery is going to pulse and put that pressure wave into the, um, the cuff. But it's all going to get lost by the damping effect of the of the hair. So in those instances, we have to start thinking about the the impact of hair. That's the same for cats and you know little pomeranians. All of these poodles, they're, they're all going to have an, a, a, an effect. Not so much for your labs because they've got nice you know short hair and your pointers and those. They're not a problem. But so how do we deal with it? The way I used to deal with it in practice, and I think it's probably the best solution I found, is to wet them down, wet that hair down. Just get a flannel. Um, or cotton wool swabs and just wet it so it's completely matted and sticks together and it acts as a pure conductor and a physical conductor and conduct the pressure waves through to the cuff so um i think maybe you're an experience in in your antipodean sort of life where <laughs> where you approach this differently not probably accepted by the british public maybe you can tell our listeners how, how you approach it down in, down in the other side of the world yeah it's a little bit different down there isn't it um i definitely think you would shock a lot of um of pet owners on the side of the world if you did did uh this particular technique <laughs> so keith's technique is fantastic wet the fur down get rid of that like air cushion get rid of the puffer jacket that's around the arm if we go to the doctors but perhaps we're just keen to shave our pets because it would not be uncommon for us to do something called ring barking and you know when you uh, place a catheter and you clip the paw and sometimes it's like a really maybe it's a fluffy collie dog that's got lots of lots of curtains around their limb and we snip those those fluffy wings off the back so that we can put the catheter tape around well we would even go as far as what we called ring barking and we would literally clip the circumference of the limb 
of that particular patient so that we could make sure that the blood pressure cuff was snug. And this is definitely something I wouldn't recommend. I think sometimes owners are <laughs> a little bit um, taken back by the fact that we've clipped them in various places for the Doppler, especially when they see a little naked patch underneath the tail on a cat. Um, but in certain circumstances where we just really wanted to monitor the blood pressure, so maybe it was a slightly more critical case, um, we would just do a little quick ring bark procedure and, and take the fur off around the circumference of the limb. However, in saying that, if it's that intensive monitoring, we would probably just be placing a, um, a intravenous blood pressure line. Um, but yeah, we used to do a bit of ring barking. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what that does show is actually how important it is to get that um conductance of the pressure wave from the artery to the cuff and you know if you need to do that and you've done that that's absolutely the right thing to do that's going to give you the best um uh, signal propagation you can get but i think we're just held up a little bit by the aesthetics of it and, and whether yeah. whether the owner is going to accept that but and probably it, it, raise it, the it, blood pressure in them to be uh, honest them, yes. <laughs> but in terms of, of physics and getting what we want that's that's the way to get a, you know a great result but because i think it just emphasizes that you do need to take into account that cushioning effect of fur and what it, what it does. So, OK, so placing that gets us our, um, our hopefully our nice signal. We've got the right cuff selection. We put it in the right place and then we, you know, during anesthesia, typically we're talking mainly about anesthesia here at the moment. Um, we can set it on an automatic mode and set it off for two or three readings, four readings every two minutes, three minutes, whatever it may be, and setting up with the appropriate size cuff on the machine. So I think that kind of gets us to the point now where we're probably going to get a result now um, that we can actually start to, to do something with. Yes, the position of that cuff relative to the heart does have a big impact. And if there's a difference, we have to compensate for it, like just like you indicated. Um, but we're now getting to the point where we can probably get, get a reading. So what are we going to get from it? We're probably going to get um, three readings. Well, we're going to get four things from it, aren't we? We're going to get, let's take the simplest one. We're going to get a heart rate, at least during the, the, the um, period where we're making the, the measurement. We often get a heart rate, which is quite useful. But what we're really looking for is to get that, that systolic, the mean and the diastolic pressure. Now, I have to address the, again, the sort of the physics of oscillometric devices and why they have a bad press. Um, they, this is a, a bold statement, they don't measure anything per se they infer a value from what they do measure and i think there's a subtle difference um the oscillometric system will basically look at pulse waves and you've got the two types the high definition and the standard one the standard one will generally inflate the cuff cut off the pulse wave so there's no signals coming through as they start to release that pressure you get these little pulse waves coming through which gain in height as more and more blood comes through and they get to a maximum uh, height and then they start to fall off as um, we start to release that pressure and the point where we release um, uh, the we get to the sort of point where the there's full release of that artery we, we get back down to a, to a small um, wave again so we've got this envelope that looks kind of like a, a steep rise and then a, and a slow slope off and the machine then starts to make some assumptions. It does regression lines on the slope going up, regression line on the slope going down, gets the intersect, determines that the intersect is some factor of the mean arterial, oh, sorry, the, the, yeah, the mean arterial. It may not be the point of mean arterial. It may be 0.8 or 0.9 of mean arterial. And all these algorithms are all carefully calculated, but privately controlled by the manufacturer. They don't tell you what they are. But they're all making that assumption and to some extent that's the same thing that's going on with high definition oscillometric devices as well they cannot measure we're not putting anything into the artery we can't be measuring that directly we're making indirect measurements and then making calculations from them so they're all basically a flawed system they're never going to tell you exactly what it is they're making a best estimate i think that's we, sh we should always be aware of that for a lot with an oscillometric system but do we really need to know whether it's 124 or 122? I don't think we do, you know, as a systolic pressure. So just want to put that out there as a sort of a caveat to oscillometric systems. People say to me, what's the best oscillometric system? Well, the best oscillometric system is the one that you're familiar with, can use easily, know how to get the best results from, and are um, comfortable with. And, you know, that may be different for different people. So I don't think there is a 
best system. The system is best if the person knows how to get the best results out of that, that system. OK, so um, I'm going to sort of you know, pass this, this thoughts on to you now. So we're going to end up with three numbers, aren't we? We're going to end up with a, a systolic, a diastolic and a mean. And what we've got to decide now is brilliant. We've got some numbers. We've got a systolic value, we've got a, a diastolic value and a mean value. What are we going to take from that? And I just I'll briefly wind up on what I'm just about to say here. I think things have changed. You know, when I was in practice um, in, you know, 20 and 30 years ago when we were using these machines, we were really hung up on systolic pressure. That was the that was the that was king then. And I think quite rightly, we've looked we've moved now towards really looking at mean arterial pressure. So mean arterial pressure is our goal. So if our mean arterial pressure is our is our goal, we're keeping hoping to keep that or monitor that. What are the ranges we're looking at? And what do we do if things go outside of them? And what does that mean? What does that mean? So if the mean arterial pressure rises or falls, what does that mean? What's going on inside our patient? Is that something you'd like to, yeah, to, 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 to give your thoughts topic. on? Yeah, it, 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 I feel like you is. opened up that can of worms and just do oh, it <laughs> waved <you>. it around. <laughs> <laughs> I think let's start with some readings. Let's start with what normal readings are for our patients under anesthesia, which might be different to our conscious patients that perhaps have um, a lot of other stress factors uh, influencing them. But when we do oscillometric blood pressures, we get a systolic, a diastolic, and a mean. So what actually matters? I like to think of it as the mean matters. So like you said, Keith, before, you like to interpret the systolic a few years ago. I'm only going to say a few, not a long time ago. <laughs> um, and now the tendency is definitely towards, uh, towards what the mean is telling us. So in terms of the ranges, let's just start with systolic blood pressure. So systolic blood pressure, typically in our anaesthetized patients, we like it to be above 90 millimeters of mercury. So about 90 to 120 millimeters of mercury for our systolic. And our mean blood pressure, we like that to be definitely above 60. So between 60 to 100 millimeters of mercury. And our diastolic blood pressure, to be honest, is one that I don't care so much for, especially in our oscillometric. Sometimes it throws out something really odd. Um, but our diastolic blood pressure is about 55 to 90 millimetres of mercury in our patients that are anaesthetised. So what actually do all those numbers mean? We, we've got the numbers and we can say, oh, yes, it is above or below this. But what actually is systolic blood pressure? So when that heart contracts and pushes the blood, we are able to measure the pressure that's on the artery the arterial wall after that heart contracts and that blood flow shows push straight out of the heart. And um, so if you imagine kind of that we, I've got, I've got my hands like in a circle right now. So we've got this vessel. We always have a slight bit of tone in our vessels. They're never really floppy and flat and collapsed. So we've always got the slight pressure. So if you can imagine a huge amount of blood being pumped, that stroke volume coming straight out of the heart, and going down the arterial system, we are going to get a pressure against the arterial wall during that blood flow. And that's what we measure as our systolic pressure. And our mean um, arterial pressure, that's actually the pressure that's needed to overcome any kind of resistance in the arterial tree to push blood right down, hopefully into the capillary bed. That's our main game. And the reason why the mean matters is because you can have a systolic that perhaps is really really high and fantastic and the systolic's 130 or 140 and if it's pushing into these floppy lungs uh, it's not lungs sorry these floppy vessels then actually that that fluid or that momentum that pressure is just kind of going to go and actually our mean will be really low because it never had the chance to get right down to the capillary bed so that's why the mean matters um, and then we have our diastolic pressure, which is also always a bit of tone in those vessels. So it's kind of the pressure against the artery wall whilst the heart is relaxing and filling in diastole. Yeah, that's brilliant. I just wanted to come in there and just um, talk about um, mean from a um, sort of a physics viewpoint. Um, as you know, this is, this is where I approach most of my, my, my problems. Um, <laughs> so the mean is a true arithmetic mean. It's an average of the of the uh, is the average pressure over time basically so it's the one that does all the driving it's the one that pushes uh, blood into the 
uh, kidneys is the one that pushes blood into muscles so that if your mean is low and, and we're probably talking to most people here that are small animal uh, clinicians but you know if you do any horse work you'll be fully aware that if your mean pressure goes down that the risk and um, potential for myopathy in horses is increased because we just haven't got that overall mean driving pressure even, nice if momentum. The, even if the systolic is high enough yeah you haven't got that that momentum um and i think momentum's a good word because um it kind of gives you an idea about how long it takes for that pulse waveform to dissipate so that um our the the we're going to talk about things called um systemic vascular resistance or total peripheral resistance depending on where you are in the world um but <clears throat> probably one of the there's only a couple of equations people need to think about when they do blood pressure cardiac output heart rate times stroke volume i think most people are familiar with that and um, blood pressure is a product of cardiac output and uh, multiplied by the um, systemic vascular resistance yeah so one thing you can sort of look at is if the pulse waveform is um long in duration so when, when you see the pulse waveform when i know you won't see it on oscillometric i'm just doing this for sort of uh, uh, explanation purposes the longer that that pulse width the width of the waveform then basically the higher the systemic vascular resistance because basically absolutely what you said Courtney it expands that aortic vessel is a very elastic tissue it fills up like a, a capacitance vessel and then once those uh, the aortic valve shuts it then basically squeezes that blood through the rest of the circulation um, and that that then has to force that blood through the resistance of the vascular beds and the, the the resistance will determine how long it takes for that to go so if you've got a very broad uh waveform on your pulse ox I and mean, this is where the two can link together your pulse ox waveform is basically it's not the same waveform as you get with blood but it's in this instance it's representing a very similar thing and you can take that the width of it is an indicator of um, your vascular resistance. If it's very narrow, um, then you, you haven't got much vascular resistance. Um, and if it's very wide, you've got quite an extreme vascular res resistance. So sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you in full. <laughs> no, Just no. wanted to sort of go into the little bit of um, what happens when the, when the blood uh, rises and just how that length of that uh, pulse relates to systemic vascular resistance and just bring in those couple of equations because although there's we don't want to talk about too much um, uh, maths and physics those two equations cardiac output and blood pressure are fundamental to what we do when we realize we've got numbers up that they're outside of where we want them to be mm -hmm. no i think that it it does become this game of of thinking about physics although <laughs> many of us would hate to admit it but it really is like a combination of looking at the pump and the pipes of the whole cardiovascular system. And when you talk about systemic vascular resistance or total peripheral resistance, really we're talking about how constricted or dilated the vessels are that the heart has to pump into. Um, so for example, if you use a alpha-2 drug like metotomidine, that's going to really vasoconstrict those vessels, how is that going to affect our heart rate? And that's when the blood pressure calculation really comes into play, just like you said. So the blood pressure calculation, just to um, say again, is a cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. So what the pump is doing into what type of pipes are there? Um, are they vasoconstricted or are they vasodilated? And then if we break down the cardiac output equation being the heart rate times the stroke volume and the stroke volume, this is just how much blood is pumped by the heart in one go. So when we think, I like to think about when I was in theatres, I used to do this and for real. Um, I kind of like teaching it by drawing up, say, a syringe of water um, just to explain. And we've got a 20 mil syringe of water and we're going to push this out of the syringe and we're going to put like a lot of force into pushing out and emptying that syringe. And then we watch the water fly out of it or the saline, whatever you're going to do in your theatre. And if you take the top of your syringe off and you just empty your syringe with lots of force, that's fantastic but then it's just kind of going to go at the out of the syringe. It's just going to fall a foot in front of you on the floor. Whereas you've, you know, you've got a big vasodilated vessel that that nice heart pump, you know, you've emptied the syringe, it's pumped the blood and then it just goes onto the floor um, because you were vasodilated and that that's going to alter your mean. And the mean is the one that matters. Um, whereas if you, for example, I used to like doing this is get that 20 mil syringe, the same 20 mil syringe. And then I used to put an 18 gauge needle on the syringe. So I made the, you know, the exit port of where or whatever the syringe had to pump into 
make it quite narrow. So I almost make them like a nice normal tone or a vasoconstricted tone. And then when I emptied that syringe of water or saline, it would fly across the room. And I'm thinking, yes, that was definitely the mean blood pressure getting right down into the tissues. And I think, why does 60 millimetres of mercury, why is that our standard point that we we like the mean blood pressure to go above. And it's typically because that's when most of our organs can autoregulate. So they can maintain a nice consistent blood flow for themselves, like our brain and our kidneys, a nice um, blood flow if the blood pressure stays between 60 to 150 millimeters of mercury. So, you know, if suddenly it needs to pull some, if it needs to vasodilate or constrict just to keep a nice steady state, it can do so if the blood pressure has a, is a, in between 60 to 150 millimeters of mercury if the mean is above 60. So that's why I think the mean matters. And if you push out your big empty syringe into vasodilated vessels or you've taken the top of your syringe, your water just falls and it doesn't really get down across the room. You know, you can't really fire it at your friend. So that's why I think it's important to know what your readings are but systolic, fantastic. You get a nice, oh, yeah, the blood rushes out of the heart and it blows up those, you know, puts a bunch of pressure on those vessels. But actually other vessels at an appropriate tone to help the momentum and the blood flow down. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, we're trying to make these, these talks as practical as possible. I think we have to consider that uh, organs like the kidney are very much pressure dependent, you know, and their function is all pressure dependent. So that if that average driving pressure, that mean pressure falls below a, a value, we start to see effects in, you know, glomerular filtration and um, uh, uh, vascular uh, passage through the kidneys, and that will have an effect. And um, I don't think it's um, unfair to say that, you know, older animals, you are at risk of, you know, causing ongoing or further kidney problems by reducing and having a uh, low blood pressure for too long during an operation. Um, don't want to get too much into the pathophysiology of that, but you know, I think on a, on a broad basis, if that if your blood pressure is too low, if it's you know, down at the 40s and you've got an old cat, then it's likely you're going to, unless you work very hard, you're going to have some recurrent problems uh, after that hop. And it, it is possible that you could be pushing other organs into, into failure as well, mm -hmm. or having muscular um, you know, perfusion problems. So yeah, I think we, we we should look at mean arterial pressure, um, which then sort of big begs the pressure now. Uh, sorry, begs the pressure, begs the question. <laughs> so what what's so we're looking for a mean of sixty. That's fine, uh, and we're typically going to see you know in a you know a, a conscious patient we're going to see like what shall we say one twenty over eighty, and the mean's going to be one hundred three, one hundred four, something like that, nice in the middle. Um, but when we got an anaesthetized patient, those those values are going to be depressed because you know. However, we've got it anesthetized, it's going to have some drugs on board. And I, I can't think of many that aren't going to have an effect on, on blood pressure. So we're probably going to see a reduction in blood pressure. Our systolic is not going to be up at the high, ideal 120. Our diastolic is not going to be up at the ideal 80. It's going to be uh, sub that. And our, as a consequence, our mean has to fall as well. So um, if it does fall, what does it, huh, what does it mean? And Mm -hmm. what what are we going to do about it you know it's all very wise like all of these these um, monitoring modalities you monitor them but you it, there's no point monitoring just to say oh look it's it's low you have to be in a position to react so I, mean, I, I kind of start the ball rolling with some very simple things you know if your if your um agent level is is too high that's very you know that would be the first my first line of attack you know if your blood pressure is low, have a look at your agent setting. Are you still, is it still on 3% because someone's not turned it down since, you know, the, the initial phases or, or they've responded to the animal getting light? So we should look look there first, but, you know, what other drugs are on board, on board? And, you know, what are the other factors? Now, we talked about blood pressure being cardiac output times uh, vascular resistance. So drugs can affect that vascular resistance, but also we can have drugs that affect cardiac output. And that could be either on the, heart rate but which is you know possible and likely but probably more likely we're going to have some effects on on um stroke volume because of, of because of preload and afterload effects so um is that something you know that that you want to expand on there about you know yeah where sure. we go because i think you know we're looking so we we got a we got a patient there the mean arterial pressure was 65 now it's 63 oh now it's 58 what do we start to think about 
to to address that because that's really why mm -hmm. we've been monitoring all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you said, every time we anaesthetize a patient, they're going to have a drug on board. It doesn't matter if they're having an anesthesia with an inhalant agent or they're having a TIVA with a you know continuous rate infusion of propofol. Pretty much all of our anesthetic drugs are going to have dose dependent effects on the cardiovascular system. So. Some of them will change the heart rate, so like metatomidine, um, although it doesn't do that directly. That reflex bradycardia is just that, it's a reflex. But also you know, drugs like acepromazine or opioids, sevoflurane, isoflurane, they're going to change the contractility of the heart muscle and how well it can you know, contract and, and force the blood out. And additionally, most of our drugs will cause a dose-dependent vasodilation as well. And I think when we say dose dependent so often in anesthesia, and I think we really must take a step back and just like what you said, it is dose dependent. Can we reduce the dose that we are giving those patients? So my first point, when there is not blood on the floor or blood on the swabs and my patient becomes hypotensive, I know the blood's still in them, um, but perhaps everything has dilated and that heart just isn't able to contract as well anymore. So my first point, first point of call when I'm investigating a blood pressure drop or a change or a trending down is I will try and reduce my volatile agent. And that actually has quite a, you know, effect that occurs over a couple of minutes. And by the next time you do your reading, you might actually see an increase in, um, in the patient's blood pressure. So when we talk a lot about contractility, I think it's worthwhile explaining that in our blood pressure calculation, contractility is one of the three factors that make up stroke volume. So we know that cardiac output is a calculation of the heart rate times stroke volume, so how often it's pumping and how much it's pumping. And then there's actually those three factors in stroke volume. So we've got preload, afterload, and contractility. Um, so preload, this is kind of the blood that is returning to the heart. Um, afterload is what the, the left ventricle has to overcome to pump the blood out of the heart. And typically this is kind of related as well to systemic vascular resistance. You know, what is the pump pumping into? What kind of pipes are they? And then that third one is contractility. And I think this might also be a can of worms, but repeated fluid boluses in our hypotensive patients don't work on every single part of this blood pressure calculation. So I think we can keep compete like continuously give fluid boluses, but uh, you know, if the contractility of the heart is poor because it's diseased or we've got our vaporizer too high, then we're not really going to see a response. So in terms of blood pressure managing management, we have a tachycardic patient that could be hypotensive, a tachycardic patient that could be hypertensive, or we can have a bradycardic patient that's hypotensive and a bradycardic patient that's hypertensive. And each of those have different reasons why they occur and different treatment options as well. So it just depends how many how many cans of those worms you want me to get off the shelf, Keith, and, yeah. and go through. <laughs> yeah, and I think um, you're right. You, you give those boluses and there's not a response, but I think you, you potentially have in those situations a point where you you can't increase the preload or you're trying to increase the preload, but the the ability of the heart to actually pump more isn't there. It can only you can't improve so its stroke volume. You're given more fluid, but it can't improve its stroke volume because you've got a contractility issue. So, yeah, absolutely. So there are many reasons. And um, I think, yeah, we should look at maybe we're worried about dropping blood pressure. So what are the major causes of dropping blood pressure? So, um, you know, the obvious things are, you know, someone's just made that bitch and that ovarian ligaments come off and you've mm. actually got blood loss. Yeah, that's a true hypovolemia, isn't it? And that's an acute hypovolemia. And that's going to give you a blood pressure, a blood pressure drop. Um, you can have um, hypovolemia um, that may be present prior to the um, procedure, you know, from a disease state. You know, you may have um, uh, a, a kidney patient or something that's, um, you know, not maintaining fluid balance very well, and that may be hypovolemic. You may have mm -hmm. a septic patient which is in shock. And now you've got, you know, total irrational and uncontrolled vasodilation of, of, of capillary and, and arterial bed. So you've got a, a hypovolemia there. Um, so there are all sorts of reasons why we could have a hypovolemia. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I like looking at, before I anesthetize a patient and we run the blood work, I like looking at the PCV and total solids because if they seem abnormal and they indicate that my patient is going to be dehydrated or hypovolemic, I'm wanting to ask the veterinary surgeon if we can start giving fluid therapy uh, before we anaesthetize that patient, because we know that the anesthesia is probably going to exacerbate it once we start to change the tone of the vessel. So even before we get that hypotensive patient in anesthesia, if I can see that they seem a little bit, we use the term crispy, <laughs> if I can see that they are dehydrated, you know, their, their PCV is high, perhaps their lactate is also high. And this could happen even in our, in our pets that have like severe dental disease and they're just not eating and drinking as much. It could be in a patient that has a fracture that is not willing to eat and drink because they've been in pain up until the point that they've been brought in. So I definitely, in those cases, absolutely give them some fluids. This is probably going to help that blood pressure. But if there's not, you know, like you said, the ligature slipped or there's blood pooling outside the patient, one of the first things I'll do is, sure, let's give them a fluid challenge and see if if there is a response. And it might not be three lots of 10 mils per kilogram. Um, it might just be one lot of five mils per kilogram. Is there a response? Even if it's not brought the blood pressure up, is there a response that seems appropriate that the patient is um, benefiting from this? And then if they are and you think, oh, give it a go again. Um, it's often that they do just need a little bit of fluid. Um, but sometimes, you know, if they've got really vasodilated vessels or poor contractility of their heart, then we're going to need drugs. We're, we're probably going to need you know, vasopressors or inotropes to change the tone of that vessel, to constrict it a little bit more, or to just help that heart beat a little bit better. Yeah, I, I absolutely. And I think, you know, we're into the realms of going into a whole new podcast <laughs> here to talk about, you know, how we would respond to a, um, a, a blood pressure fall, which may or may not be due to hypovolemia, uh, maybe due to um, vascular changes, but the essence is you've got a um, an animal that's, that's got a drop in blood pressure, um, and it really is that's a, that's a huge subject. Um, but I think you know, to, to sort of generalise, then we need to you know look at the common things that are common. So if that blood pressure is low, yeah, look at your agent, look at the drugs on board. You know, can you reduce the agent levels? Um, can you increase the, the the fluid or give fluid? Um, are there any simple um, things that you can look at, do you need to use presses and, and things like that. I think once we start going into that, I say it's, it's a whole new podcast. And I don't really want to get into, into that today. This was really to look at how you use um, non-invasive blood pressure machines, how you use them confidently to get the best results and then um, get it. Once you've got those results, which ones, what, what numbers do you look at? How do you assess those numbers? How do you work with those numbers? Um, and what do those numbers mean in terms of you know normal um, physiological function? So I think you know we, we got to a point where yeah we could have uh, it's not just another podcast. I think this is that it's, it's a huge subject, isn't it? Because there are so many variables as to, as to why your um, systemic vascular resistance could be low uh, and why your blood pressure could be low. Um, that that we, we haven't got time to get into that now. But hopefully we've covered the, the base concepts of of what we're measuring and how we would respond to it. Is there any um, um, things that you think we, we could, that we haven't mentioned that are, that are crucial that, that, um, that our, our listeners should be aware of? I think, I think we've mentioned everything, but perhaps just as, as a summary, you know, if we start with our Doppler blood pressure, that's kind of giving us an indication of systolic in dogs and between mean and systolic in cats. So perhaps instead of that 90 to 120 millimetres of mercury for cats could be okay from about 80 um, millimetres of mercury in cats. And then when we do our oscillometric, we we know how cleverly designed those cuffs have been and that there's lots of machine factors and algorithms and settings that we need to change when we do oscillometric and that we need a patient that is still um, there's no point having the panting dog standing there consciously trying to get a blood pressure because their whole body's moving. So I think knowing the limitations of both of those different devices as well helps. And ultimately, with blood pressure measurements in practice, we're really just taking those numbers and assuming that the tissue perfusion is accurate or adequate. Sorry, the tissue perfusion is adequate. Um, we're just doing a lot of assumptions with blood pressure. But ultimately, the most valuable thing for me is is what the trend is doing. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Because you know, 
our blood pressure um, formula is cardiac output times vascular resistance, but we have no way really of measuring vascular resistance. We can only um, infer what it is. And we also have, in most cases, no idea of what cardiac output is and no way of measuring it either. Mm -hmm. So we can only go on, you know, um, if you're lucky and you've got some sort of uh, indicator of a pulse waveform, which I think pulse ox is, is something that can be used just to indicate you know, some idea about what's going on in that uh, vascular system. Have to bear in mind that when you look at a pulse ox, you're looking at it right down at something which is fairly peripheral. So you're not looking at the same thing as you're looking at with the, you know, um, aortic pulse, but it's a, it's an indication of it. And, and, and you can't change the, the you, know, you, you can a bit, but you can't grossly change the duration of it. So it does give you an indication of that vascular resistance. So uh, if the if it's nice and broad, yeah, you have got in, a, a, a decent uh, vascular resistance. That may have some bearing on how you would uh, approach the um, fall in blood pressure. So uh, I think, yeah, to, to wind up, we're going to talk in the next episode about uh, invasive blood pressure. So we're going to carry on with some of these concepts. We may expand on them a bit more in terms of um, uh, a, a treatment, but in terms of uh, fluid treatments. But essentially, I think, you know, go away with that message that blood pressure now, we're looking at mean values. And if your mean value is too low, you're not going to get the perfusion you need. And we should be um, looking at that, which does, you know, it does call into question the, the usefulness of uh, Doppler. If we're really Doppler's giving us a more of a, a systolic value, that's not a necessarily a representation of of a mean arterial value. So it may be not such a good modality as, as a, a, an oscillometric system. Um, and I did say I've mentioned a very little bit about the, the HDO system. Um, the HDO system has gone some way to improve on the basics of the oscillometric system. It has better algorithms. Um, it has you have that clarity of actually seeing the the uh, on the screen the the waveforms and and you do see the effective pulse envelope you know which is the outline of all those waveforms. So you have got a bit a lot more information, um, but it does still derive the signal in the same way that a standard oscillometric system does. So it is prone to all the problems associated with you know cuff selection cuff placement noise as well even though you can put in some clever algorithms to try and help with things like arrhythmias and what have you it's still prone to those those problems so what would i say take home message my take home message on our telemetric systems would be great except at the very beginning that it's a flawed system you're never going to get a, a, a perfect reading it's going to vary um it's going to vary between you know one or two readings sequential readings um, vary between user and vary between um, uh, one week to the next if a different user different cuff you know they're never going to be a precise measurement um, so but a good system a very easy to use system and will, can give you an awful lot of information i think i would much rather go into a um an anesthesia with a non-invasive blood pressure system sat there giving me information than without it mm -hmm. No, I definitely agree. I'd rather I'd rather something um, give me an indication than to just throw them all out the door and and just you know do the anesthesia without it. So knowing its limitations and the functionalities, I still would rather have one. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, well I think we're going to wind it up there um, for this episode, and uh, the next episode is going to be we're going to be talking about invasive blood pressure um, and how we do that what that means for our patient, the information we can get from that. And um, that'll form the next next basis of our podcast. Thanks for everybody for listening and we'll be back uh, with you very shortly. Thanks, Courtney. Talk soon. See you later. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. Don't forget to follow our podcast to stay up to date with the latest episodes and feel free to share this with your team. If you have any questions or feedback for us or simply want to know more about what you've just heard, please feel free to send us an email at clinical support at burtons.uk.com. Thanks for listening and catch you next time.